Good morning. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Human Progress and Flourishing Workshop. In this workshop, we bring in scholars from across the country to present insights from their research to the NDSU community. Topics focus on innovation, opportunity, and ways to increase individual and societal flourishing. I'm really excited today that we're joined by Patrick Wolf. Uh, Pat and I have been friends for a long time. Uh, we've known each other for about 50 years. Hard to believe that I, you probably thought I wasn't even, I know the students don't even think I'm 50 years old, but I've known Pat since I've been, so for about 50 years. And so I'm really excited that he's here today to present on school choice, a really important topic for North Dakota. And so I want to give, give a brief introduction uh, of Pat, and then we'll welcome him. So doc, Dr. Patrick Wolf is a distinguished professor of education policy in the 21st century endowed chair in school choice at the University of Arkansas. Recently, he completed three years of service as interim head of the Department of Education Reform. He has led influential studies of private school voucher programs in Washington, D.C., Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the state of Louisiana, and Delhi, India. Research projects led or co-led by Wolf have received 45 research grants and contracts totaling over $23 million. He has authored, co-authored, edited, or co-edited five books and over 200 journal articles, book chapters, and policy reports on private school choice, public charter schools, special education, civic values, public management, and campaign finance. Education Week consistently ranks him among the 200 most influential education scholars in the United States. He has received his bachelor's degree from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, his master's degree and doctorate from Harvard University, and his high school degree from St. Cloud Cathedral in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and his uh, elementary school degree from St. Peter's and Paul Middle School in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Those two last ones are not in his bio, but we went to school together. So let's all welcome Dr. Patrick Wolf. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you all. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk with you about the opportunity that the state of North Dakota has to launch, to design and launch a private school choice program, and what benefits might accrue to the state uh, should they uh, become a school choice state. All right. Need some technical. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's working now. So, uh, first, a little bit more about me. Uh, this is a photo uh, from my childhood uh, that was so long ago that color had not yet been invented. So everything was black and white. Uh, but you, you might look at me. So, so this, is, this is in St. Cloud, about, about two miles from the, from the Bitsen compound. Uh, and and uh, you might notice uh, the, the young man in the middle there, in the middle of, of my two uh, uh, brutal sisters, older sisters. And, and you might think, you know, what a cute guy. What happened? Well, what happened was that was the year I met John Bitson. <laughs> Knowing John ages a person, that's for sure. But I got through it and went on to do a lot of research on private school choice. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I'm going to talk about what is school choice? What are we talking about here? Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what the profile of North Dakota is um, and, and how school choice might benefit it. Whoops. Okay, and then um, I'm going to talk about how we forecast benefits for a state if it adopts a particular public policy uh, and the areas in which we might see benefits from choice include uh, the, the benefits of, of the attainment or the, the achievement of participants, the attainment of participants, uh, the achievement of those who are affected by competition from the program, 
uh, the fiscal effects, and then kind of uh, kind of wrapping it all up. So, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and so I'll start with what is school choice? So school choices can be understood as any government program that provides resources to assist parents in selecting a private school for their child as an alternative to their assigned public school. And it comes in a number of flavors. The traditional form of private school choice is school vouchers. And those are government uh, payments to parents that they can sign over to a school uh, to, to cover the tuition at that private school. There also is a variety of private school choice called tax credit scholarships. And these uh, operate much like school vouchers, except they're funded differently. Instead of being funded directly by the government, by the state government, they are funded through tax credits provided to individuals and corporations that donate to uh, a, a scholarship granting organization and, and that scholarship granting organization then provides the, the scholarships for students to cover tuition. The uh, newest, or an, 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 another form, another sort of, sort of alteration on the classic private school choice approach is just to give parents tax credits and tax deductions directly for the private schooling expenses that they encounter. Uh, by sending their child to a private school. And the newest form of school choice, and one that's gaining great popularity, it's the, in public opinion polling, it, it, it's the number one choice for uh, the public in terms of levels of support, is education savings accounts. And these are modeled um, like health savings accounts and other types of programs where basically parents are given a access to an expenditure account to purchase products and services in support of their child's education. So those are the different forms. Uh, how do they work? So, so with school vouchers, the, the key operational component of school vouchers is the payments to parents and parents then sign that check over to the private school that they uh, enroll their child in. Typically, there is substantial regulation of participating private schools in school voucher programs. And the school voucher programs are especially popular with students with disabilities. Many of the voucher programs are limited to students who have an individualized education plan because they have a disability. The tax credit scholarships, a big part of the tax credit scholarships is the fundraising that has to take place in the background because, because basically the dollars never touch the government. Uh, they, are, they are sent from individuals and corporations to these scholarship granting organizations. And uh, then the individuals or corporations file a report about their donation. They document their donation and they receive a credit back from the state off the, of their state taxes as a result. And that credit can vary. Uh, it's the, the, the lowest percentage of credit is in Missouri, which gives 50 cents back to the donor for every dollar that they contribute. Uh, but many states, including my current state of Arkansas, gives 100% back to the donor. So basically you're getting, you're, you're giving your money to an organization that provides scholarships to low income kids to go to private school and you're getting 100% of your donation back. So that's tax credit scholarships. Uh, with the individual credits and deductions that like the tax credit scholarships that's handled on the tax side, it's handled just when individuals, when families file their income taxes in states with these kinds of programs. There are 11 states that have these kinds of programs. They, it's, it's just part of their state taxes. And then finally, with the education savings accounts, uh, typically what happens is the government contracts with a organization to implement these programs. Uh, and they kind of have two different structures for how parents access 
the educational products and services that they use to customize their child's education. One of the approaches is to use a debit card. They just, the government downloads uh, $5,000, $6,000, $7,000 onto a debit card that has restricted use. It's a restricted use debit card. So it's pre-programmed to only be spent uh, on uh, for with vendors approved vendors who are providing certain products and services that are educationally related for their child and they just go out and they use the debit card to purchase those services for their child until it's all uh, expended the second approach is modeled after the um, the healthcare reforms of the Obama administration, the, the healthcare marketplace, health insurance marketplace. And that's where the state basically establishes an education marketplace for families participating in the ESA programs. The approved vendors uh, have a spot on that website uh, and, and they offer their products and services to parents uh, and the parents' accounts are on the website too. So in that sense, the parents never actually receive the money. The, the money is made available to them on, on the website in the marketplace and they arrange transfers to the different vendors for education products and services for their child. So that's how private school choice works. The old school approach is, is resources to help them choose a private school. Uh, the new wave approach with ESAs is much more flexible. It can accommodate parents who just want to send their child to a private school. They can use all the money on their debit card or they can choose that private school enrollment through the marketplace. Or it can be used by homeschool families um, or, or private schooling families to augment the education they're receiving through tutoring, through educational technology curriculum, uh, therapies, etc. So, so the ESA is much more flexible. That's been a source of its increased popularity. So where do we see school choice across the United States? We see it in most states. Uh, these are the different kinds of programs are color coded uh, with these dots uh, across the different states. Um, and you see, uh, there's one state there. Whoops. There's one state there, North Dakota, that is uh, a bit of a donut hole. It's a, bit, it's a bit of an island of no school choice uh, surrounded by a sea of school choice. Even if you go to the north of North Dakota, which of course are the provinces of Canada, the provinces of Canada have had private school choice for over a hundred years. So you even have school choice on your northern border. You have it on your southern border with South Dakota's tax credit scholarship program. You have it on your western border with Montana's uh, ESA program and tax credit scholarship program. And you have it on your eastern border with Minnesota's individual tax credit. So, so North Dakota is all alone in its region, not offering private school choice. And, and there's, there is sort of a sense that, that that won't last for long and that North Dakota is ready to pop uh, and adopt a private school choice program. So basically, I'm gonna talk about, uh, you know, the, the educational situation in North Dakota and how it might be affected by a uh, private school choice program launched in the state in the near future. So here are current enrollments by school sector in the state of North Dakota. You see that line at the top is public school enrollments. So, you know, that basically public school enrollments dominate the enrollments. It's about 88% of all students in the state of North Dakota are attending a public school. And the other interesting thing about that line, and this distinguishes North Dakota from most states in the United States, is that that line is increasing. Public school enrollments are going up in North Dakota, even after the pandemic. Uh, so that, that you know, in, in a way, that creates an opportunity to make it easier to do a private school choice program, because uh, otherwise the public school sector is going to be pressed uh, for it, it, it to deal with 
the influx of new students coming in. It won't have the infrastructure and the facilities and would have to, to make major uh, capital investments. So it would be a good time for North Dakota to allow families who wish to attend private schools instead. Private school enrollment is, is relatively modest in the state. Uh, about 12,000 students are attending private schools. So that's about eight and a half percent of the total K-12 student population. It's slightly lower than the national average, which is about nine and a half percent. The homeschooling population also is substantial in North Dakota. You have almost 5,000 K-12 students being schooled at home, and there are types of school private school choice initiatives, particularly the ESA type of initiative that can accommodate homeschool students. So how are these students doing? Uh, these are NAEP scores uh, over the last decade here in North Dakota. And the top two lines are eighth grade scores on math and reading. The bottom two lines are fourth grade scores on math and reading. Uh, what you see is that there was a gentle rise in these scores until around 2017. So even pre-pandemic, the performance of K-12 students in North Dakota started to decline. And the COVID pandemic basically accelerated that decline. Uh, this is pretty common across the country that uh, the pandemic harmed student achievement, diminished student achievement, but that decline in North Dakota actually started pre-pandemic. So this also would be a good time for an intervention geared toward turning things around and improving achievement in North Dakota. So how do we forecast the benefits of a major policy intervention? So basically you start by predicting the population that will participate in the program. How many people will participate if a private school choice program is launched. Then you basically determine, you draw upon what is known about what's likely to happen to those students. What kinds of, of gains or losses are they likely to experience from participating? Then you apply basically the best measure of what those effects will bring about in terms of things like lifetime earnings and, and, and such. So, so you get a sense of what the consequences of the effects of private school choice will be. Uh, then basically you sum it all up and that gives you an, an idea of the forecasted benefit of, in this case, private school choice for the state of North Dakota. So that's what I'll be presenting for the rest of, of my presentation. And I just wanna give a, a, a proviso. There are a couple of limits to any forecast. You hear it a lot when people talk about, about uh, investment forecasts, and that is past performance is no guarantee of future returns. So we are drawing from evidence from the past uh, in order to forecast the future, but forecasts are always uncertain and probabilistic. And the second thing is my calculations, which I'm gonna show my work here. So you're gonna see my calculations, but my calculations um, are somewhat preliminary. I, 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 they, they're what I might call farm fresh, uh, which is appropriate because my mother's side of the family actually owns a farm in Minot, North Dakota. So, or near Minot, North Dakota. So see what I did there? Uh, but it does mean that, that these, these are initial impressions and, and the actual results could, could, could differ. But an advantage that North Dakota has as a late adopter of private school choice is there is a wealth of evidence about the effects that these programs tend to have on students. And there also is a lot of experience 34 states have experience implementing private school choice. And the folks who are designing and implementing a policy in North Dakota uh, can learn from that wealth of experience and may very well produce better outcomes from their private school choice program 
than those that we will be that I will be summarizing and presenting here. So that's where we are, uh, and the basic equation that informs these forecasts is that the benefit derives from the number of participants, the effect that the program has on those participants, that is whatever, whatever effect uh, we can forecast, and then the, the returns from that kind of an effect. So that's the general, the general equation that we'll use, um, and let's dive into it. So first, participant achievement. The idea here is that by participating in the program, uh, we will, we, the, certain students will benefit. How many students will benefit? Well, first we have to predict how many will participate. And here I'm suggesting that the state of North Dakota can derive some uh, estimates from West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia, is a good model for what's likely to happen with the private school choice initiative in North Dakota, because like North Dakota, it is a rural state with a handful of medium sized cities. So the, the geography is, is similar in West Virginia. Um, the population has many similarities in West Virginia. And fortunately, West Virginia adopted a universal ESA program three years ago. So they, they are establishing a track record of, uh, of participation rates that can inform these estimates. So basically, if we look at uh, North Dakota and we apply the, uh, the and, and we examine their, uh, the comparison of the, diff the profiles of the different states, we see there are a lot of similarities very close uh, similarity in terms of the percentage of students who are in district run public schools, uh, a very close similarity in terms of the percentage who are homeschooled and, and, and the uh, current increase, the growth in that rate since just before the pandemic, 40% in both of those cases. Um, we see that the private school sector is more extensive and robust in North Dakota than in West Virginia. Uh, so that is a difference, but it's, it's hard to find a perfect match for North Dakota, right? I mean, no, no state's as good as North Dakota. No state is, is exactly the same as North Dakota, but I, there are enough comparisons with West Virginia. I think that North Dakota can learn from their experience. And the one thing we wanna derive from West Virginia's experience is what kind of rate and number of participants are we likely to get from a universal ESA program launched in North Dakota? Uh, and, and so if we look at West Virginia, what they experienced is the first year they launched their program, nine tenths of 1% of eligible students participated. So basically there isn't an overwhelming rush to join private school choice programs. Participation tends to grow incrementally. By the second year, you know, it was up to uh, over 2% participation. And then by the third year, it hit 3%. And this is actually quite typical of states who have adopted universal school choice programs, this gradual incremental increase in participation. So if we apply that to the state of North Dakota, and the population of K-12 students here in this state, you know, we see that there will be about 1,200 participants we might expect, or a little less than that, almost 1,100 participants the first year, uh, about 2,700 the second year, and a little uh, less than 5,000 participants the third year uh, in, in, in a program here. And we will use those estimates, especially the first year cohort estimates, to determine <laughs> the benefits uh, of a program, to forecast the benefits of the program. So the first forecast is for uh, achievement. And here, basically the benefit is, or the formula is benefit equals the number of participants times the effect, times uh, the gain that they're likely to experience. And basically what returns 
will come from that achievement gain over their lifetime. Uh, in, in, in addition to or as an increment above the average lifetime earnings for the state of North Dakota. Uh, basically, the gains are derived from a meta analysis that Danny Shaquille led uh, that looks at the results from all of the rigorous studies, of the effect of private school choice on, on achievement levels. So it's a pretty solid estimate of how much students gain from achievement uh, when they participate in these programs. Uh, and basically the returns are calculated from work by Rick Hanyashek of Stanford University, establishing how much more lifetime earnings people gain when their achievement levels increase by a certain increment. Uh, so we have all the components we need to calculate the uh, participant effects, the returns from the participant effects. We see for an individual student participating in cohort one, and, and I'm just looking at cohort one because it takes a few years for achievement effects to demonstrate themselves in a school choice program. It takes about three years. So we're just taking cohort one, bringing them through three years of participation, accounting for some program attrition, and then, and then pricing all this out, we see a benefit of about $5,600 per student. And when you multiply it by the number of students who will receive that benefit, you get about 3.8 million in, in total benefits. Okay, and uh, basically the, the average lifetime earnings come from the, from the um, US uh, Department of Labor. So uh, moving on to attainment. Attainment is how far people go in school. Achievement is how much they learn as measured by test scores. Attainment is actually more important for success in life than achievement. It's more important uh, how far you go in school than it is how much you know. Uh, and we have a lot of information about uh, the uh, likely attainment effects that we can plug into this, uh, this basic formula. Again, benefits, number of participants times the attainment effect uh, times the returns that will uh, accrue to them for having uh, more graduates, more likelihood of graduating, especially from high school. The gains come from uh, a study that I did uh, with, with colleagues. The attainment gains come from a, a study I did with colleagues of the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. And the returns on those gains come from a study that a, a colleague and I did of the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program. So basically here we see that uh, we can expect a 7% increase in the likelihood of high school graduation from cohort one participants in a choice program in North Dakota, that should yield about 48 additional high school graduates. Uh, and there will be substantial benefits, uh, lifetime benefits in terms of, of income, health, uh, and other monetized benefits from those 48 extra graduates. Uh, each one gaining almost $350,000 in lifetime uh, benefits from graduating from high school. And so a total of over 16 million in group benefits. So now let's go on and look at the uh, systemic effects of a private school choice program because a choice program doesn't just affect those participating in it. It generates competition that pressures public schools to improve their performance. And there's a long set of studies that document that the test scores of students who remain in public schools go up when those public schools are pressured by the launch of a school choice program. And so the formula here is the benefits for the students who are in public schools affected by uh, choice programs. And here, that end, those participants who are affected, I limit it to the students in the six largest public schools, school districts in the state of North Dakota. These are school districts that enroll 7,000 students or more. Because those K-12 
communities also have a sufficiently large concentration of private schools where the public schools are going to really feel pressure from a school choice program. Uh, the gains uh, that we estimate, these are the gains for the public school students as a result of the private school choice program, are derived from a meta-analysis conducted by Harira Jabbar and her colleagues. Uh, and the benefits, again, from achievement gains are drawn from the, the Hanyashek, uh, Kane, and Rivkin uh, study uh, back in 2005. So we see we have a much larger group of students who are affected, over 61,000 public school students in those six districts. Um, the average effect is tiny. It's very small. It's, it's, it's a tenth of a percent of a, it's a tenth of one percent of a standard deviation, which is a very small effect, but applied to a large number of students. And then, you know, the gain per student is going to be about $35 in, in additional lifetimes earnings, not much, but with so many students affected, that's a, a group benefit of over $2 million. So finally, let's forecast the fiscal effects of the private, a private school choice program. Uh, and basically the formula here is, is you take the number of public school students who switch out of the public schools and use an ESA for their education, instead of being funded in the public school system, they will be funded through this private school choice program. You take the number of, of those, what we call switchers, public school switchers into the program, and you multiply that by the difference between the amount of money the government would spend on those students if they remained in public schools, minus the maximum value of the ESA. Um, that's the price differential or cost differential for the state uh, regarding each public school switcher into the program. That's the money the state saves. But you subtract from that the money that the state uh, spends on students already in private school or already being homeschooled. Um, so, so uh, basically the state's going to save money on public school switchers into the program. It's going to lose money or it's going to be spending additional money on students already in private schools and homeschooled. And so the ratio of switchers to non-switchers is critical in determining what the fiscal effects of the program will be. A very typical ratio for the first year of the program is a 40% switcher rate. So 40% new kids coming in out of public, public schools, 60% of the students being supported by the state as private and, and homeschool students. And so I assumed a 40% uh, switcher rate uh, in these calculations, but fortunately uh, spending, total, total per pupil spending in the public schools is sufficiently greater than the likely value of the ESA. I set the likely value of the ESA um, as, as a little more than $8,000 uh, to begin because typically these ESA values are set at 90% of the foundation aid to uh, students in the public schools. Foundation aid is about two thirds of total per pupil aid. Um, so, so basically the amount going to kids in these programs is always less than the amount that would be spent on them in public schools. In this case, it's, uh, it's about 49% of what would be spent there. So there are net fiscal savings eventually, uh, but not the first year because 60% of the students are being subsidized as private school and homeschool students. Um, there is a net cost to the state the first year if they implemented the program under these conditions. What happens is once current private and homeschool students have already enrolled in the program, a greater percentage of the students participating in private school choice are public school switchers. Uh, and so that percentage goes up over time uh, and, and that allows the program to eventually generate a fiscal benefit uh, after 
three years based on this calculation developed by, by uh, Marty Lucan. We see that uh, for every dollar spent on the program, the state can expect to get a dollar and 11 cents back in savings. So the program actually has a net fiscal benefit even within three years. Um, and the public dollar figures are, are come from, from the North Dakota State Department of Ed. So summing it all up, basically um, these are the fiscal benefits that we see, uh, we can forecast that we would see from the launch of a universal ESA program in North Dakota in the near future. Um, and uh, with an expenditure of a little less than $70 million, the state would get that amount back plus about $8 million more, and the participants would receive a total of over $22 million in lifetime benefits just from that first cohort of students. So that's my calculation. Um, that's that's my, my forecast, uh, given those assumptions and parameters. And I welcome questions from the audience. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, so the two questions were, are, are um, what is the comparison of NAEP scores and NAEP score trends for private schools compared to public schools? And in states that have launched private school choice programs, has there been a significant increase in the supply of private schools? So the first question, uh, students who are in private schools score higher on the NAEP exams. That's been consistent over time. Now, part of that is because absent school choice programs, generally only upper income families have access to private schools. So part of that is, there is a, a higher income demographic that typically attends private schools. Uh, but but uh, another important factor is that uh, through the pandemic, private school performance on the NAEP did not decline. That's the one education sector where students maintained their levels of educational performance, whereas in the district-run public school sector, the performance levels went down quite a bit. So, so yeah, there's, 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 once you factor in that, that yes, they're, they're likely to be performing at a higher level because uh, they tend to be higher, to attract a higher income demographic, but still, at least they, they maintained their performance during the crisis and, and public school students declined. Uh, second question was about private school supply. We, in, in the states that have launched universal uh, school choice programs, either voucher programs, there are some universal voucher programs, particularly Indiana, the state of Indiana has the largest ones but also uh, universal ESA programs. We see some increase in the private school supply. It generally isn't as large as uh, is necessary to meet all the demands. So there is a supply constraint, which is another reason why the participation numbers aren't, aren't huge at the front end. But we're seeing more supply come online and particularly we're seeing supply come online in the form of micro schools. So it used to be if you launched a private school, you needed you know, several million dollars to buy land, and then you needed more million dollars to build a big facility, or you had to rent an existing facility that was large and had all the accommodations. But what we learned in the pandemic is that small groups of neighbors can band together get a group of 12 to 15 kids, pool their resources, hire a professional teacher, and get access to supplemental materials, Khan Academy and other such things, and basically run an effective private school with an enrollment of, of 10 to 15 students. 
And coming out of the pandemic, we have this new type of private school called micro schools. And these kinds of schools can pop up even in rural areas like many parts of North Dakota, because you don't need the critical mass of students that you used to need to have the financial support to, to launch a private school. So going forward, we're seeing a stronger supply side response in states that have universal school choice, especially if they have the ESA model. Yes, sir. So our daughter is a teacher in rural North Dakota. She's very concerned about the impact of school choice. So what besides micro schools might be the effects on rural areas? Because they're worried about the loss of funds. Sure. Right. So, so it, it's interesting. Um, there is a sense, a, a lot of people are of the opinion that that universal school choice won't affect rural communities at all, because many of them don't have private schools. Uh, there was a study released a couple like a year ago that looked at census data. And actually, in census regions classified as rural, 70% of the school age students in those areas live within a 30 minute drive of an existing private school. So there is more access to private schooling in rural communities than, than people expect. And so, so there, can, there will be some participation, some switching of students from public to private schools in rural areas. Plus you have, you have the pandemic or you have the, um, the micro school issue, but there won't be a lot. There won't be a lot. And especially in rural areas that have strong public schools, because if the public schools are a pillar of the community, if they're being responsive to student needs, they have nothing to fear from competition from school choice. And those schools don't lose uh, enrollment. Another uh, thing that we've observed through research is uh, interesting developments in Florida. So Florida has 30 school districts that are in rural areas and Florida has a very expansive private school choice program. Uh, it was originally launched by, by Jeb Bush in the late 1990s and it's grown to serve uh, over 200,000 students in the state of Florida. So what's happened in the rural areas? What's happened to the public schools in the rural areas of Florida? Well, a couple of things have happened. They've lost market share. So the percentage of school age students being in, enrolled in district run public schools in rural areas of Florida has gone down and the percent enrolled in private schools has gone up. Okay, well, that's what we expect when there's private school choice. People, students will be switching out of public schools and the market share of private schools will go up. But the really interesting finding is that average enrollment in the public schools in those rural districts has gone up. So the public school systems in rural areas of Florida actually have higher student enrollments as they have lost some market share. Well, what could explain that? It's math. The only mathematical explanation is that more families with school-aged children are moving into rural areas. Why are they moving into rural areas? Because they know they have access to school choice, but they don't always use it. Uh, many of these families are moving into rural areas, enrolling their children in the district run public schools to test them out. And they can do that with the confidence that if it doesn't work out, they can switch their child to a private school through the choice program. So in a sense, the availability of school choice becomes a quality of life benefit in rural areas and it's attracting more families with school-aged children to rural areas because they know they can try out the public school and they have an escape hatch if necessary uh, through the choice program yes patrick um, yeah thanks for coming on here great talk um two uh, two questions one is about the effect of school choice on the most um, in my 
experience as a journalist, it seems that the more disadvantaged a student, the greater the impact. Um, you know, I wrote about this, and um, maybe up to 80% of the students I wrote about would never have graduated had they not been in the school program. Um, the other question I have is about the long-term impact in terms of the difference between public schools and the private schools in the school choice system. You mentioned Canada, where I grew up, um, where there has been a school choice for a very long time. But over time, the, the difference between them disappears. Just that, you know, the, 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 the private schools in Canada, who get the money are for the most part Catholic, and they're, and they're today very almost identical to the public schools. Okay, so the two questions were one, uh, for which types of students is private school choice most effective, most impactful? Is it the more disadvantaged types of students? And the second question is, over time, do public and private schools kind of grow to reflect each other or mirror each other in a school choice area? That's the, the homogenization uh, sort of hypothesis. So, so the first answer to the first question is, we do have evidence that private school choice is most attractive to and delivers uh, its clearest positive benefits to disadvantaged subpopulations of students. So one category of students is students with disabilities. Students with disabilities disproportionately participate in private school choice programs. I did a calculation about six months ago uh, based on the demographic information of the students in all the programs across the country. And about 17% of the students uh, enrolled in private school choice programs were students with disabilities. Uh, and that compares to just 15% is the rate of students with disabilities in public schools. So, so uh, the schools, school choice programs over enroll students with disabilities. Now, how well do they serve them? It's difficult to determine that because most of these programs that serve kids with disabilities excuse those students from testing. So we don't know the achievement effects of private school choice programs on students with disabilities, but we do know the parent satisfaction rates and they're very high. Uh, parents of students with disabilities who, who enroll them in a private school through a choice program uh, have very high rates of satisfaction with the educational service they're receiving. A second area is students, uh, uh, African American students. They also disproportionately participate in choice programs, especially the programs in urban areas. Uh, and there we do have a wealth of data on the test score effects of private school choice programs on African-American students. And the average gain for African-American students in the programs is higher than the average gain for white and Latino students. Uh, and we think that the reason for that is because of residential assignment, African-American students in the inner city tend to be assigned to some of the lowest performing public schools. So when they participate in a choice program uh, and switch to a private school, the upside gain in the uh, environment and the educational program at that private school is greater for the average African-American student than it is for the average white or Latino student. So, so in those two areas, uh, Private school choice is especially popular for kids with disabilities. Private school choice is especially effective for African-American students. And, and we see that reflected in public opinion polling too, where African-Americans are all, Americans of all types of all political parties are supportive of private school choice at a rate of 60 to 70% in through a, a series of polls. But the rate of support is highest for African-Americans who respond to polls. It's more like 75% for them, especially African-American parents. They are the single demographic most supported, supportive of private school choice. Yes, Andrew. Uh, would you speak broadly about the benefits in uh, 
attainment or achievement or, or however you'd like to couch it um, for those students who remain in a public school in a, in a competitive choice environment. Um, and maybe also, especially the uh, benefits to teachers. Okay. Uh, whether mm -hmm. they remain or, or choose to. Yeah, so, so, so two embedded questions there. Uh, the first is, is to talk about more about the gains in achievement for public school students in public schools that face competition from private school choice. And the second question is the benefits of private school choice for teachers. So answer the first question is the, the, the effects, there haven't been studies of the effects of competition from, pri from private school choice on the attainment levels of students who remain in public school. So we don't know if students uh, go farther in school because their public school was pressured by school choice. But there have been over 30 studies of the effect of private school choice competition on the achievement levels of public school students. And critics of school choice have said for a long time, competition from private school choice will destroy public schools. They can't respond to that competition. They will be emptied out and their children, the children who do stay there will suffer. Well, we haven't seen any of that happen in these 30 studies. We see very consistent findings of small positive achievement effects of the students who remain in public schools that are pressured by competition. There, there have been some studies of what public schools do specifically when they're faced with competition from school choice. If student test scores go up, what is being changed? What is being modified in the public schools to make that happen? Uh, basically, uh, the common findings are that uh, the worst teachers are removed from the classroom in those affected public schools and replaced by better teachers. Classroom teachers are given more autonomy, more freedom to teach the way that, that, that they know how to teach. New programs are launched, particularly for disadvantaged students, because otherwise those disadvantaged students are a big flight risk for the public schools. So those are the changes that we see public schools make in response to competition. Those are very positive changes. And in many cases, they have the effect, they have a two-pronged effect. One, they allow the public school to hold on to its student population because the, the public school offering is more attractive to that population uh, so they don't feel they have to switch to a private school. And secondly, their test scores go up. Uh, on the question of what private school choice has to offer teachers, well, it, I mean, it offers the freedom of choice to public school teachers just as it offers the freedom of choice to public school parents. Uh, and so in states that have very robust private school choice programs, you see more movement of teachers across the school sectors from public to private um, and, and, uh, and, and uh, especially you see uh, a lot of the uh, teachers who are establishing these micro schools tend to be former public school teachers who basically felt, you know, I have a vision for a small school that will have this kind of curriculum and this kind of pedagogical approach. I've always wanted to run my own school here's a chance for me to do it. So it, it sort of liberates the space for opportunities and entrepreneurialism by uh, public school teachers themselves. And I know I didn't answer Patrick's second question, so let me go back to that. Uh, and, and it is about do the schools in the public and private sector tend to mirror each other over time in a choice environment? In some ways they do, um, there, there is, you know, there is a tendency for, um, for, for private schools in, in a school choice environment to adopt some of the characteristics of the public schools. Uh, but, but they also, there also is a, is a,
tendency for them to maintain some distinctiveness. Because if there, aren't any, if there isn't any difference between a private school and a public school, parents are more likely to send their child to the public school. The areas of distinctiveness that are most popular for private schools, certainly number one is religion, is having a religious element to the school, religious values, religious practices. Parents are very attracted to that, and it's a significant reason why uh, they switch into a private school, not only for the religious uh, teaching and the religious training and values, but for what that means in terms of security and safety and character for formation of the students. So, uh, so, so that's one element that, of, of distinctiveness that remains. And I think a second element that's very important is size. Private schools are, and I think will remain in the future, much smaller than public schools. The public school system in the United States in the 20th century committed itself to this idea of bigger is better and economies of scale. And so we grew from, from the, the 19th century public school, the little you know, one room schoolhouse that became so famous. We transitioned to these massive public schools, these factory size kinds of systems of education. And in hindsight, I think that was very unhealthy for students. Uh, education, K-12 education is a service best deserved in a boutique setting on a small scale because it's so interpersonal. And in small private schools, the school leaders and the school personnel are better able to establish a strong culture, a culture of high expectations, a culture of mutual respect, security and safety. And public schools, especially in the inner city, because they are so large, it's just virtually impossible for them to achieve the uh, beneficial educational environments that small private schools can, can achieve. And so I think there's gonna to continue to be that difference. Even if, even if curriculum is similar, even if you know, AP course offerings and those kinds of things are similar across public and private, I think there still is going to be distinctiveness about private school culture um, and, and the size and scale of private schools that will be attractive to many parents. Yes, ma'am. Um, have you looked at uh, magnet and charter schools that are publicly funded? Does that provide similar effects? And I don't think those are allowed in North Dakota currently, but uh, is that any different? Or yes. Uh, so the question is, um, have, I ex have I looked at the effects of ma public magnet schools and public charter schools? Um, they, they are not uh, uh, available in North Dakota. North Dakota does not allow magnet schools or, or charter schools. Magnet schools are district-run schools that um, are, are designed. There are, there are two types of magnet schools. One are performance magnets, and the other are racial integration magnets. Performance magnets are test-in test schools. Where, where students have to score very high on an admissions test to get in. Uh, racial integration schools are designed to attract uh, students of different races uh, in the same school to promote the value of racial integration. And, uh, and, and basically, when you look at the results of magnet schools, it's really tough to judge the effects of magnet schools because the, the test in magnet schools are selecting their students based on ability. So what do you compare them with? Uh, the racial integration magnet schools, some of them have shown positive effects both on integration and on achievement. The Boston magnet schools are probably the best known ones, but there isn't a lot of research on magnet schools <clears throat> And uh, there's also a lot of controversy, especially about the test in magnet schools. New York City, under uh, their former mayor de Blasio, proposed to eliminate all test in magnet schools. But, but parents like them. If, if their kid can get in, the parents really like them. So there was a big uh, pushback against that. 
Charter schools, there's a lot more research on public charter schools. So ch charter schools are publicly funded and uh, there's no charge to students and all students can apply to charter schools regardless of their, their residence. Um, but charter schools are independently operated. So they have a lot more autonomy uh, to innovate and try different things than a district run public school does. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of research on charter schools. The most important research was done by Mackie Raymond at Stanford University in the National Charter School Study. And what they found is 10 years ago, the performance of students in public charter schools was actually slightly lower than the performance of similar students in district run schools. The charter school model was still relatively new. A lot of the charter schools themselves were relatively new. And it takes a while for a school to kind of get its sea legs and, and, and get to a level of high performance. Five years ago, public charter school, students in public charter schools were performing at about the same level as similar people, in, similar students in district run schools in the same study. And then uh, a year ago, when the final uh, national charter school study was released, uh, the evidence was clear that students in public charter schools were outperforming similar students in district run public schools. So the charter school sector had improved to a point where it's now delivering positive value add relative to district run public schools. So public charter schools are a good option for families too. There's also a lot of distinctiveness across uh, public charter schools and they are especially effective in urban areas where the residentially assigned public schools struggle so, so mightily. Uh, but yes, they are, they are not permitted in North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota is one of four states in the United States that do not allow public charter schools. That would certainly be an option for the state, but I think uh, education savings accounts are even a more attractive option because of their flexibility.